Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you to Vanderbilt, Francis, Owen, and all the people that should be thanked, the Federal Judicial Center. Uh, it's been a very exciting day for me so far. I've been a lot of these, and I'm learning a lot, as always. Okay, so I'm here to give you a slightly different picture, but I think of my, my main task is to help you think clearly as judges about what you should do when you have the authority to do it. In 1982 through 84, the American Bar Association and the American Psychiatric Association took a long look at whether or not there should be a control excuse for criminal responsibility. And both organizations, the American Psychiatric and the American Bar Association, took the position there should not be a control excuse for criminal responsibility, because although we do have a common sense way of talking about I can't help myself, we really don't know how to conceptualize it, and we don't know how to measure it. What this slide is, is a funding opportunity announcement from the National Institutes of Health from 2010, and basically you don't have to read it, but what it says is we're still trying to figure this out. This is a really hard problem. Obviously you heard from BJ, and now you've heard from Radana that we have some measures that do get at this, but there's no consensual agreement on how to conceptualize or how to measure self-control. And again, this is just some more quotes to that effect. Here's a moral fable from real life. This is a character you all don't personally know, but know about, you the judges. This is Leroy Powell. You recall the subject of Powell against Texas when the Supreme Court was asked to decide whether Robinson against California controlled whether Powell, who was a chronic late-stage alcoholic, was entitled to a quote-unquote involuntariness defense for being drunk in public. And he was drunk in public, and he went straight from a really low-level magistrate's court in Texas right up to the Supreme Court. The way this worked uh, procedurally is there was nothing in between. Now, his expert, a Dr. Wade, got up and said, look, this is a guy who has an overwhelming desire to drink, and yes, he has a little bit of control maybe over the first drink, but once he starts, he cannot stop. Here's his cross-examination. And, you know, the first bit is the cross. Just read it for yourself. This is right out of the Supreme Court's opinion. Clearly, the biology that Radana has just explained to you explains in part, not totally as she knows, but explains in part why it was so hard for him to find another reason that would replace the reason to drink, but finally he had one and he stopped. He was able not, and the fact that he didn't have money, he could have broken into a store, he could have done a mugging, all the things you're all familiar with that addicts will sometimes do to support their habit. And that is my basic thesis. Essentially, this. We're going to be thinking about whether or not the law should have mitigating or excusing force for addiction and what other kinds of legal policies we might decide to support to help deal with the ravages of drugs, both at the individual level and at the legal policy level. But to understand this, you have to understand your own last which is that the law's criteria, as you all know, if you just step back from it for a second, the law's criteria, um, criteria are folk psychological, meaning actions and mental states. All our criteria are behavioral, meaning actions and mental states. And that means the criteria for us are not biological. Biology is always involved. If your brain is dead, you're dead, you're not of much interest at all. So biology is always going to be involved. But essentially, we're dealing with folk psychological criteria. And what that means is our task, or I should say the expert's task, and we ask them, they have to do the work of translation. On the one hand, you've got the very mechanistic concepts of neuroscience that you've been hearing about, starting with Jeff's wonderful talk and right through Radana, where we're talking about brains and nervous systems and neurotransmitters and the like. That's all mechanistic stuff. When we're talking about addicts and addictions and their behaviors, 
We're talking folk psychology. So what we need is we need translation. We need to say, and by the way, this is not true just in addiction. This is true in all neuroscience that would come into the courtroom or legal policy. Show me precisely how these neuroscientific findings answer my legal question. That's always our question in the courtroom and for society at large. What's our social policy question? Show me precisely how, in fact, these scientific findings should alter our public policy. Now, here's a second major take-home message, and I can actually stop with the second take-home message once I've done translation, which is the fact that something may be the sign or symptom of a disease does not necessarily mean that any legal or moral conclusion should be drawn from it. If we are going to talk about a folk psychological excusing or mitigating condition, such as lack of rational capacity, lack of uh, self-control capacity, that has to be demonstrated independently behaviorally to say, oh, seeking and using substances is the sign of the brain disease addiction that's true, but it doesn't tell you whether we ought to mitigate or excuse it and say, well, obviously it's a sign or a symptom of a disease. How could it be something for which you're responsible? But note what's going on. We don't care, and I'll just move along here. Here are the sort of four things that you might say accompany addiction. Anatomical signs, the kinds of brain changes we're going to talk about. Physiological signs. Similarly, psychological signs, things like craving, we don't criminalize those. I mean, the unconstitutional do so under Robinson against California. What are we concerned with as a matter of legal policy and individual case adjudication? We are concerned with human action. Even if seeking and using drugs and other behaviors associated with addiction or the addictive lifestyle are signs and symptoms. They're also actions. And action can always be evaluated morally and legally. OK. I have a little provocative note there at the end. If people stop using, they're no longer addicted. How long do they have to stop using before we say they're no longer addicted? There's no right answer to that question yet. Are they in remission? Are they cured? Are they temporarily cured? Those are actually interesting questions. All right. Here, this is just, a, by the way, you'll get these slides. They're going to be available. I've put in a lot more that I'm going to talk about because I simply don't have the time. So I'm going to be skipping over a bunch of things to get to the main messages. Here, I just want to say, to think that addiction is only a disease is not helpful, in my view, especially not for legal policy. To think that it's a moral weakness is especially unhelpful, because that is probably not what it is either. If you were to ask me what, how I would describe it, I would say, is addiction a habit that is potentiated by biological, psychological, and sociological variables? I'd say, yes, that's what it is. And it, obviously, this is a continuum concept. For some people, it's a very hard habit to break for all those reasons at the biological level, the psychological level, and the socio-cultural level. And for other people, it's less hard. But it's a really bad habit. And I'm perfectly happy to think biologically about these bad habits, socio-culturally, and psychologically. Anything that helps me deal with the phenomenon. And I don't want to rule out any level of explanation. What I have here is what I have, just two examples, you can get them again, of what I consider to be the uh, the medical imperialism, that addiction is simply a chronic and relapsing brain disease, which I do not think it is, even if it is a disease. Here are some inconvenient facts. The importance of set and setting. What people's sort of psychological preconditions are as they approach drugs, what's going on socioculturally around them. The sample for imaging, most of the images you see are not done on addicts who are a random sample of addicts. They are addicts who are in treatment. Addicts who are in treatment are not a random sample. 
they are disproportionately what's known as comorbid or duly diagnosed. That is, they also have other major mental disorders. And it's very difficult to disentangle what's the drug problem from what's the other mental disorder problem or the interaction between the two. Similarly, the sample for relapse is not a random sample. It's typically people who've been in treatment. They do tend to relapse at high rates. But as the psychologist Gene Heyman has shown, and has re-shown and re-shown among all the major mental disorders, addiction is the most spontaneously <coughs> remitting. Between 70 and 80 percent of addicts quit without treatment. And the drugs for which it seems to be hardest to stay clean are alcohol and nicotine. But the controlled substances, most people quit without treatment. And how do they do that? They quit. We don't know how they do it, but they were addicted and they quit. Now addiction is a very unusual disease. Here's what we know, that all sorts of behaviors can contribute to contracting a disease, lots of diseases. You're overweight, you're at higher risk for diabetes, you're higher risk for heart disease. Uh, how do you get sexually transmitted diseases? Not by just sitting and watching erotic films. Anyhow, you also can behaviorally help control your disease. But the mechanisms of disease, the signs of disease themselves, are infrequently actions. If you think about it, if you're not seeking and using drugs, you're not an addict, essentially. So it's one of the very few diseases where action is the primary characteristic. Because I don't care what your brain looks like, if you're not using, you're not using. Okay. I'm going to skip over this. In thinking about responsibility and social policy, I think we want to make some very careful distinctions. There are many different kind of actions that might be associated with the addictions that we might want to think differently about. So let's just take responsibility, criminal responsibility. How about just seeking and using for personal use? You don't commit other crimes, you're not dealing, anything of the sort. You're just a user, and let's assume you're an addicted user, not just a chipper user, someone who does it recreationally. You're an addict. Okay, now the person comes in and says, you know, I really can't help myself. You might think for that crime of seeking and using for personal use, you'd be somewhat more forgiving. But how about if the person wants to do immoral and other illegal acts performed to support the addiction? And now think about a range of things, from shoplifting, how about larceny from the person, how about robbery? How about armed robbery? How about murder? Do you want to have the exact same reaction to all of those? Because what the interesting thing is, if you think about addiction as one thing, here's what you forget. Schizophrenia and bipolar disorder are not price elastic. Addiction is. You raise the costs, it goes down. Make it cheaper, it's going to go up. So we have a fair degree of control if we want to exert it. So will you be as forgiving about a murder as you might be about shoplifting? And then how about illegal acts related to the addictive lifestyle? Now, those don't seem to be part of addiction itself. It seems to be part of a lifestyle choice. Do you want to be as forgiving, assuming you want to be forgiving, at all? Okay. Now. Notice that when we're talking about addiction, we're talking about excuse or mitigation, not defeat of the prima facie case. In all cases, now I never say all, but I'm going to say all, good enough for government work. In all cases, your defendant is going to have the mens rea for the prima facie case of whatever crime it was. Intentionally sought and used drugs, intentionally committed an armed robbery, intentionally dealt, intentionally whatever. That's not going to be the issue. Your issue is going to be, gee, despite having the prima facie case, is this someone who is less responsible for themselves? Now, what can neuroscience and genetics tell us generally about the actions of interest? At present, not a whole lot for all sorts of reasons, the sorts of criminal conduct we're concerned with, because the kinds of studies, excellent studies, that are being done in labs such as those at NIDA, are not 
basically trying to answer the questions we're concerned with. That's a problem. By the way, in the primer that was handed out, there is a wonderful chapter on the addictions and law that goes through some of these things in more detail, so I won't do much with it here now. You can find that in that chapter. Okay, what are the theories of excuse and mitigation that might be at work? Well, one might be compulsion or coercion. Well, you know, I put a gun to somebody's head, that's one kind of coercion. I have pulled somebody's arm, that's a literal mechanism. Then there's the appetite view. I really, really want it badly, and that's why I can't help myself. And then there's what I call the internal duress view. If I don't get it, I'm going to feel like such hell, it's almost like a gun to my head. Now, I'm actually much more attracted to what I call the irrationality view of excuse or mitigation in these cases. And I'll come back to it in a minute, but basically it says what these conditions are marked by is failures of rational control. And that is what I think is crucial. Now, another interesting point in thinking about excuse and mitigation is there are going to be enormous individual differences. You saw that with BJ's data earlier. Right? There are going to be enormous individual differences, and the problem is we can't measure those differences yet. We really can't distinguish between can't and won't. All right. So here are some questions, because what most people want to say about addiction is it's a compulsion problem, at least from a legal point of view. How is the desire for drugs different from an equally strong desire of any other sort? Might be different pathways, might be different biology, but it's subjectively experienced as equally strong. How is the desire for drugs any different? And are desires irresistible forces? We have real trouble measuring things like the strength of desire, control, capacity, and effort. Is the person failing in a self-control test because they can't or because they're just not exerting enough effort? These are really hard problems to work on in the social science. Okay, here's my favorite way of thinking about it. And this developed from my own work with addicts ages and ages ago. What addicts will sometimes tell you, and these are metaphors, it's like a buzzing in my ears. I can't get that tune out of my head. I can't think of anything else. So when I'm about to do something stupid, I can't think of the good reasons not to. Right? Basically, think about someone who is so hungry or so thirsty, they just can't think of anything except eating or drinking. And it might be a little bit that way. So then it's hard for you to be rational. Think of the next point. How about when the addict isn't in that peak craving mode, when he or she is quiescent for one reason or another? And there are many periods when they're quiescent. What do they know, even if they're in denial? It's going to happen again. They know it's going to happen again. And so what's your duty if you're somebody getting in trouble with the criminal law when you're quiescent? You better do whatever it takes because you're going to be responsible for getting yourself into that non-responsible condition later on. I mean, if you are, God help you, someone who's a strong pedophile, you better lock yourself up in a room and not be around kids. Okay. The medical model and agency. How does telling people their behaviors are the sign of an illness expect, uh, affect the experience of self-control and agency? This has been studied, but we're not really sure yet. It could either go one of two ways. Either it could make you feel like, gee, I'm a helpless puppet because it's just a sign or a symptom of a disease, or not. We don't know. How about the effects on treatment of thinking it's a disease? Does that help or does that hinder? Some issues on decriminalization and agency. Decriminalization is much in the air these days. It's no longer considered wacko. Well, the criminal law has a distinctive moral voice. We're telling people by judging them with blame and conviction that you've done something wrong that deserves societal blame and conviction. Why is it wrong to use drugs? You know, this is the way I start a discussion of drugs with my criminal law students. Why is it wrong? What's wrong with using drugs? Per se, don't talk about externalities yet. You know, the social cultures. If you want to use drugs recreationally, what's wrong with that? 
So suppose we move to decriminalization. Are we depriving fallible people of a good reason? Because after all, fear of criminal sanctions actually does change the rate of addiction and addiction-related behaviors. No question about it. It's elastic. You know, when we got rid of various prohibitions or added various prohibitions, behaviors changed. So treatment. Last word on treatment. Uh, as Rodonna said, there's clear evidence, I think now, John Monaghan and others have shown this, that leveraging people into treatment really works. In fact, our best treatment programs are with people who really have a good enough reason to stay off the stuff. Doctors, lawyers, and pilots. We've got these wonderful programs with these folks where we coerce the hell out of them and constantly test them and give them psychosocial interventions as well. Why do they work? I think they work because the longer you stay clean, especially if you have other good enough motivational reasons, you're going to find something better than drugs over time. Drug courts. Here's my problem with drug courts. No one has ever done a good random assignment study of drug courts. They look effective, but they're cherry picking. We really don't know. Now, here's where neuroscience, I think, can really help us. Many of you, and I'm done in one minute, Many of you would love to have treatments available, and Radana's given you some indications of what sorts of treatments there are. Now, earlier on, someone, I, was it you, Jeff, referred to a study recently that came out that showed a neural signature will predict among people with serious depression who's likely to succeed with cognitive therapy and who's more likely to succeed on drugs. Now the same could be true with drug addicts. It could be the case, assuming we have effective treatments that are for all addicts, not just addicts who are duly diagnosed, wouldn't we like to know ahead of time who are the people likely to succeed on which kind of programs and who are the people not likely to su succeed on which kinds of programs? And neuroscience might help us there. Here's my final message. <coughs> What I think addicts need to do, what will help them the most, is they need to find a better reason in life for living than drugs. And anything we can help them do, although most people find it by themselves, typically by the mid to late 30s, is the best thing we can do for addicts to help them. Give them a good enough reason to quit. Thank you.